Hello, everyone, and I'm sorry to say, welcome to another edition of Heavy Hands. I'm your host, Connor Rebush. With me, as always, is Phil McKenzie. Um, it seemed oh so likely, Phil, that Providence saved us this week. It seemed like that was what was going to happen. You know, my computer uh, just completely exploded. There's shrapnel flying out of it right now. But just to show how unloved I am by God, <laughs> it's working well enough for us to record our Smith versus Spawn episode. Or is it Span? We haven't been able to figure it out. Oh, yeah. I'm Connor. Yeah. This is Phil. <laughs> Phil, let the people hear your energetic, vigorous enthusiasm. Uh, the, the weird thing about this one is that it's been looming <laughs> on the road ahead of us for so long. Yeah. We, we, we identified it quite a while back. And then we kept thinking that it was going to be next week. Yeah. And it's one where the horror has sort of only grown over time. I feel like what's it's gonna, been deferred. What's going to happen is we're going to, yeah, and then we got a reprieve, which was then taken away from us, which is really extra uh, salt in the wound. I feel like what's going to happen is we're going to break this down thinking, you know what, at least next week we have Volkanovsky Ortega, and then we're going to wake up next Tuesday morning. And Smith versus Spawn will be ahead of us on the schedule again. <laughs> <laughs> no one else will know what we're talking about. It'll be a horrible Groundhog's Day scenario where we just have to break down this fight over and over again. I mean, at least we'd get incredibly good at it. I don't um... know. I, I don't know. <laughs> I think I, I don't know if I have it in me. Um, I'm not sure how, how good I can break it down right now, but we are going to try our best. We're going to talk about Smith versus Superman Spawn. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> we're also going to talk about up to two other fights on this card, which is about the maximum of fights that will hold interest. Phil, if you want, you can just go ahead and say, have fun doing the Vivi right now. No, I'm, I'm definitely holding that till the end. Great. The I thought I'd need to, I need to have something to look forward to. Connor. Yeah. This is the only thing keeping you alive through this. Uh, Smith versus Spawn Span. Um, Ewan Kudalaba versus Devin Clark. Not necessarily a great fight, but, uh, if we're going to talk about one light heavyweight shit show, that one even seems like a more promising one. And then, um, Arman Soruki and Christos Giagos, which is itself also not a fantastic matchup per se. Uh, but Armand Sarukian is certainly a very good fighter and arguably the best single athlete on this card. Um, so we, we got to talk about him. He's, he's, he's the next generation of wrestle boxer. And, um, I'm just going to try not to think about him or his style too much while we, uh, address the others. Cause it'll, it'll really will distract me. Um, after that, I think we're going to touch on a couple of UFC 266 undercard bouts because, um, by robbing cards like Spawn versus Smith, the UFC has ensured that at least now, two weeks out, fingers crossed, UFC 266 is very, very stacked. And, um, at least by, certainly by the standards of the cards we've been getting. So we might talk about, um, Opterakima versus Daukaus, an interesting heavyweight fight. Dan Hooker versus Nasrat Hakparast, sure to be an intensely exciting lightweight fight. All of those are way, way better than anything we're going to have to talk about here. So let's go, Phil. Go, go, go. Who's going to win? Smith or Spawn? Uh, the fans. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> I mean, this one is actually quite hard to it recall, is. I think, in a weird way, because... One of the terrifying things about looking at it is that you're like, oh, these guys' recent records look look all right. I mean, presumably at least part of it is the light heavyweight illusion. You know, like when like when Shogun had that had that weirdly recent that weirdly good yeah. run. Yeah. But like you numerically, this is this is appalling. He looks he looks like a borderline contender. Yeah. Um, but. Uh, yeah, so like, Span has only really lost in recent memory to Johnny Walker. Uh, other than that, he's on a giant win streak going back to like when he lost to Carl Robeson on Dana White's Contender Series. Yeah. Um, lost Johnny Walker in one of the silliest fights you will ever see. Oh, yes. 
I mean, uh, that's the that's Ryan Span at his best, just being a loony, dropping Johnny um, Walker twice, and then getting like uh, KO'd with Travis Brown elbows. Yeah, yeah, and that that's what I that's the only thing I ever want to see from him. Right, I want to see him like fighting for one round, basically. Well, yeah. Um, well, you and you say that, but um, the one thing that would have been even better, they came this close within a hair of a simultaneous KO of, yeah. a, of a double knockout in that same fight. So, why are we complaining so much? You know, he's had some fun first rounds. <laughs> so has Anthony Smith. Well, what are we worried about? Rounds two, three, four, and five. Yes, that is that is exactly what we're worried about. <laughs> um, so yeah, the, the problems are that Anthony Smith, I think, I think we're seeing more and more can simply just get bullied out of the fight if it goes deeper than round one because he doesn't have any defense and he's uh, he's still you know a non-athlete who came up from. Uh, who came up from, from, uh, middleweight. Yeah. And I think he can, he can just get bullied. And because he doesn't really have any way of stopping people from bullying him other than, um, unloading offense. He just, he's, he, he's not great past round one. And round span, uh, it's strange. I mean, he, he really feels like a, I was, as I was saying when we were watching, when we were watching tape, he really feels like a heavyweight fighter. Yeah. He has like singular bursts of sloppy violence and then just long periods of nothing sporadically mixed up with clinching. Um, and. So you've got to feel like there's going to be a first round where you've got to, there's probably a relatively strong edge to Anthony Smith. Yeah. Uh, because he is the longer, straighter puncher. And then after that, you've got to assume that it just devolves into awful slop. Which is very difficult to predict. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm going to default to saying span. It just seems more natural. Span is... um. He's interesting because he's, I mean, he's not interesting, but he, he is, he is, he is really not interesting. But, um, given, <laughs> given what we have to work with, he's interesting in that he's a special kind of well-rounded. He's, this is the, this is the trouble I have with assessing him. He, um, he's like, he's pretty well-rounded without anything standing out. Yeah, as we agreed, he's basically the he's the Leon Edwards um, of the light heavyweight division. Yeah, slightly better if, than Leon. Um, yeah, if if Leon Edwards could finish people, right? Rather than, you know, getting rather than getting finished by uh, Nate Diaz. Yeah, God, imagine Leon Edwards versus Sam Alvey. <laughs> could have been even worse. Um. But he also sometimes looks pretty good, Ryan Spann. This is the trouble I have with him is that the, it's hard for me to put my finger on what is not functioning about his game. Um, he does a lot of the things that I would be asking the average, um, you know, disappointing light heavyweight, your, your Devin Clarks, your, uh, your, uh, your William Knights, et cetera. Um, I would be asking them to do. Which is like, don't just be a muscle guy. Do jabs. You know, the, put combinations together. Ryan Spann does all these things. He's actually a pretty diligent jabber. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, he, he can sort of counterpunch. It always sort of feels like an accident when it works, but he can counterpunch. I think it's just, I think there is a tension underwriting every single thing Ryan Spann does in the cage. That makes it look like he's not being as successful as he is. Um, cause, cause let, let's be real. This is a guy with tons of first round finishes. Um, who has, as we've said, a, a really credible record in the UFC's light heavyweight division, uh, which, you know, it is what it is. Um, and yet he always looks like he hates what's happening. That's that, I think that's the feeling that makes me 
that makes me just like expect his downfall every time I see him. He he's tense. He loads up um, on every action. Um, the pieces might come in the right order, but there's not much flow. It's like Curtis Blades is striking, or like Kevin Lee's striking. Like, okay, somebody with the right ideas is telling this person how to do it, but it's not connecting well. And when it's, you, I think you see the, like, how thin the veneer of Ryan Spann's technique is. I'm talking mostly about striking here. Surprise, surprise. But I think you see how thin that veneer is when, when a sequence of the techniques gets interrupted. And you're like, oh, he's freaking out. Like he didn't, he wasn't prepared for that to possibly happen. He wasn't prepared to have to eat a jab and then, you know, make an adjustment and continue his combination. The moment to moment adjustments are just like too panicked and therefore end up reading as like cumbersome. Does that, does any of that make sense? That, that tracks. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, and yeah, we'll, what you mentioned about his uh, his boxing and you know his his tendency is his jab and so on. I think that's that has genuinely improved. I think the um, the um, who was it? Um, failed prospect always gets knocked out now. Uh, Misha Sirkunov. Uh-huh. Uh, he that was a, an open stance matchup, I think, which. Uh, Span used a surprising amount of the jab yeah. in that in that fight, and you know the the KO was, or at least the first knockdown that ended that ended that led to the knockout was it was insanely ugly, but yeah, it had decent ideas behind it. Yeah, and that he was trying to parry the jab, trying to draw Kutalaba's jab out and parry it, and then come back with the right hand once they were in exchanges. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I think it's just that, you know, amongst other things, he's in- incredibly leaden footed. Yeah. Uh, he's, he's always rude. trying to, you know, he's one of these people where he's worked on his hands. And meanwhile, his feet are, it's still, st- still mean that he's essentially yeah. walking around the cage after people. That is a big part of the stiffness, so, too, is like in mid combination, there are no adjustment steps mm-hmm. in Ryan, St- uh, Ryan Spann's footwork. Yeah, so I think looking at that, you can say he's so he's going to plod around after Anthony Smith. Do you need to be particularly quick to close Anthony Smith down? I don't know that you necessarily do. Yeah. Um, but I don't think he has quite the same like level of wrestling and particularly like single leg focus that's going to make Anthony Smith less likely to low kick him. Yeah, I mean, that's the trouble is, um, Smith, the feeling of this is like, oh, Smith is almost certainly going to, cause he does have a sense of flow when he's working his jab. He does mm-hmm. make small adjustments and take a little subtle angles, you know, as subtle as you can in this division. But he, he, between the two of them, he looks like a guy who's done some boxing rounds. Um, yep. some, and, and the low kicks are absolutely a part of, uh, a striking arsenal as well. All these things just feel sort of more natural and better integrated. The feeling is that despite all that early success, Anthony Smith is going to collapse. But, but is, is Ryan Spann going to not collapse? Yeah. The, the issue is, does yeah Ryan Spann drop to a level of activity where he can't actually pull much back away from Anthony Smith. Like, right. If we, if we get that Alvi fight, like uh, Sam Alvi is uh, certainly at this point in his career, a, a, a dreadful round winning fighter. Yeah. Simply appalling. The, and Anthony Smith, say what you like from him. I don't think he will do like the John Jones thing of, of, curling up into a shell if Ryan Spann is coming after him. No. I think he will at least keep throwing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I do think that Spann looks genuinely a bit better last time out. I think those late rounds are going to be competitive and awful. 
Yeah. Uh, like genuinely probably pretty hard to watch. Going to be some parts where, uh, because like I said, the span will throw in combination. There'll be parts where he will jab in to get inside Anthony Smith's reach. Anthony Smith's reach and Smith will freak out and back himself into the fence and probably run away. And, uh, then Span will plod slowly after him. And, realize you know, I that, think we should realize that he can't maintain the pace that he himself set early in round one. We'll also yeah. get tired. And then, and then what? <laughs> yeah. I mean, so basically I think we're in for some insanely ugly rounds. I don't really trust Span to be able to win them. Uh, I do kind of trust Anthony Smith to be able to win round one. And I also think he has, he still has just the possibility of finishing Span in round one as well. So I think, you know, on that balance against the fact of Smith, you know, just potentially getting physically overpowered over five rounds again, I think I'm still going to take Anthony Smith. I think the prob- probabilities of him winning a decision plus the possibilities of him just knocking Span out or, or submitting him, I think are a bit too, they're, they're higher on balance. But yeah, I think unfortunately the, the most likely single outcome is that we get a heinous slog down, especially like the last three rounds. Mm hmm. Yeah, I'm going to take Smith as well. I mean, I, it's crazy because he, we, we have, it feels very recently been reminded once again that of who Smith was as a middleweight, Mm -hmm. which is, you know, kind of like the same things we've been saying about Span, a guy who starts super hot and then kind of crumbles. But I know that Smith is a lion heart. Yep. He can be woken up from his crumble. If the opponent is not consistent enough to smash him. Um, and the guys that he lost to, Glover Teixeira and Alexander Rakic, uh, Rakic especially in that particular fight were really like one note in their determination to hold on to the momentum, to continue taking Smith down, to continue smashing him. Um, after that first sort of, uh, adrenaline dump. And if Span himself is going to have one of those, um, you know, Span, a guy who, yes, he might overpower, uh, Anthony Smith, you know, like Smith, when, when Anthony Smith gets taken down, for example, it's just like he puts his feet super duper close together in the clinch and kind of falls over. Yep. Um, but if Smith himself is going for takedowns against a tired, unbelievably flat-footed Ryan Span, I trust him more to find late solutions on the ground. He's done it before. He did it to Volkan Uzdemir, another guy who is normally actually fairly consistent, and Smith still just survived long enough that when Uzdemir started to run out of ideas, um, he was able to submit him. Yeah, that's just one of the things. Smith has simply... He doesn't hit his re- his record is obviously his recent record is obviously a lot kind of numerically worse than Ryan Spans, but he's because he's beaten better people, yeah, and has then gone on to bigger fights, which he has then generally lost. As you pointed out but, last you know, week, he's been in an insane seven main events before this one. I think this is his seventh, right? Oh my god, something like that. But yeah, it's. But he, he's he's beaten Vulcan Uzdemir, like a a prime Vulcan Uzdemir, and yeah. Ryan Span hasn't beaten anyone that good. Yeah. Uh, I mean, he's beaten. You know, even the even the faded people tend to be better than the people that Span's beaten. You know, he's beaten even a faded Alexander Gustafsson. Yeah, and yeah, and I trust um, I trust Smith. After I'm, I'm assuming both men get tired pretty soon after round one. I trust Smith more to be like stumbling after somebody, just insisting on landing ugly one twos until he can make something happen. And yeah, I also. I mean, and he was the, still, mm-hmm. he was still like tearing up Glover Teixeira until the end of round two. Yeah, that's true. And Glover Teixeira is is much better than Ryan Span. He is. Uh, so yeah, I, I think I think Span has shown genuine improvements. I think. I wouldn't necessarily be surprised if he does realize he can just jab in to Smith and then Smith will immediately try and back out of punching range. 
and he can just rinse and repeat that. But he's just never done it before, so it'd be it'd have to be like a genuine improvement from someone who has like historically not been someone who's wowed us. Yep. All right, that'll do it. Twenty minutes is God, good lord. Twenty minutes is more than enough. Let's take a break. When we come back, Iwan Kudalaba versus Devin Clark, a light heavyweight fight, no better, but sillier. <laughs> it's sillier. So we got to we'll take what we can get. And then Armand Sarukian versus Christos Jagos. Again, not a fantastic matchup, but Armand Sarukian is a fantastic fighter. Um, so that one is definitely worth talking about. After that, UFC 266's least interesting fights. Just kidding. Uh, Hooker Hawk Pross is a hell of a good fight, and we're at least going to talk about that after this. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening to this week's Heavy Hands. If you like what you hear, please consider pledging to support the podcast on Patreon. Patreon is basically continuous crowdfunding. You sign up to contribute a certain amount per month to help us with production costs and the like, and in return you get rewards ranging from a mention on the Heavy Hands website to a question or topic of your choice being discussed on the show. We have a lot more in the works to reward you for your help, and we appreciate every contribution. No amount is too small. Just head over to patreon.com and find how you can help out the only show dedicated to the finer points of face punching. Now let's get back to it. All right. Welcome back to Heavy Hands. We are uh, moving through the undercard here. We're going to try not to spend too, too much time on either of these fights. So strap yourselves in for 35 minutes if you want Kudalaba versus Devin Clark. Phil, both of us were just watching uh, Iwan Kudalaba's most recent fight against Dustin Jacoby. Good fight. Anyone out there hasn't seen this one yet? Um, a super well-matched uh, contest where, like, if Dustin Jacoby was 10% more confident, he uh, he probably could have won it. And if Iwan Kudalaba was about 30% less confident, he probably could have won it. <laughs> but such were the pathologies of both fighters that they uh, they just had a a close fight with some big momentum shifts and um, sort of an awkward, like, even third round. In it, though, we see um, all the stuff that Iwan Kudalaba is good at and all the stuff he's terrible at. Uh, which, like, it's really two things he's good at and just one thing, really, I guess, that he's terrible at. But it's a very broad thing. Um, we saw his wrestling which has not made nearly enough uh, appearances in his UFC run. It is a solid aspect of his game. He is a smothering, exhausting clinch wrestler um, with some real chain wrestling ability. And I remember saying this when Kudalaba first got to the UFC, Phil, that he was like, uh, he reminded me of Cain Velasquez on the ground. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, in that he would just light people up as they were trying desperately to scramble free and just stay right on top of them um, and keep landing punches in these seemingly endless transitions and scrambles. Um, a really exciting sort of pressure fighter, swarmer sort of idea of how to land ground and pound is to let the guy move and then use his movement as an opportunity to hurt him. Um, but he can't turn it off. You know, he's super tough. He's got wrestling and, uh, and, and some, some really good sort of ancillary skills to go with that wrestling. But he can't turn it off, Phil. He's Ewan Kudalab. <laughs> he gets, yeah, so... I mean, Kane, Kane Velasquez worked because Kane had, at least in his prime, had infinite cardio compared to any other heavyweight. Yeah. And was uh, always, Ewan Kudalab does not. A part and parcel of that, I'm sure, is the fact that Kane Velasquez was a very calm fighter. Very mm. calm. Uh, and Iwan Kudalaba is not. I'm convinced he would have much better cardio right this moment if you could somehow take all the anger out of his heart. But you can't do that. You know, no one's succeeded so far. He just gets so mad and throws so stupidly um, and, and pushes a pace that no one could maintain. Not even Cain Velasquez could maintain the pace that you want Kodalaba to put on Dustin Jacoby in the first round. He, he went for 11 takedowns, completing eight of them, and threw like, I mean, let me check, let me check the stats, see what they say. Cause I need to look at the insignificant strikes as well to get a true picture. They say 59 strikes, eight of 11 takedowns. Uh, constant pace for light heavyweight. 
And then he got really tired. And Dustin Jacoby was able to figure his way back into the fight. And if he had been just a little more confident in his skills, he would have won. Um, instead, it was a split draw. So now we put this man against Devin Clark. What's Devin Clark good at? I mean, he's Ryan Spann, but worse. Sure. But is he worse? He's all, in some ways, he's almost better. I don't think he has, <laughs> he doesn't have delusions of being the real Ryan Spann. In what ways is Devin Clark better than Ryan Spann? Well, he doesn't, um, I've never seen Devin Clark fight like exactly the wrong kind of fight for an opponent. I think materially he's absolutely worse. But I sort of like Devin Clark better, I guess is what I'm saying. Um, like I'll never forgive Ryan Spann for that Sam Alvey fight. It is, it is awful. It's not just a bad fight. I mean, it's pretty funny. It's actually relatively entertaining. He's just making exactly all of the wrong decisions if you're fighting Sam Alvey. And this is an especially decrepit Sam Alvey. And at no point does Ryan Spann seem to learn from what is happening. He just keeps trying it harder. Devin Clark at least will come in with like um a sort of like narrow, tailored idea of what he wants to do in the fight. And if that doesn't mm-hmm. work, it all falls apart. But I, I feel like he's a little better uh process-wise than Ryan Spann. He feels like more of a natural fighter. Uh, if you know what I mean. Which yeah. is, which, you know, we're speaking relatively here. It's still Devin Clark. It's, it's still Devin Clark. Uh huh. Yeah, he's also just, uh, someone where, you know, you said we've, we've pretty much seen those small technical improvements in Ryan Spann's boxing. We've never really seen that from Devin Clark. No. Um, he really is just like a. He, he's someone who's just okay everywhere and is quite physical. Mm-hmm. But he's he's not particularly durable. Mm-hmm. Um, he's uh, yeah, he's defensively not that great. He's about as as plodding as uh, Ryan Spann is, and he also runs out of gas after the first round. Yep. And he got instantly taken down by Anthony Smith, of all people. Instantly, yeah. Um, yeah, he doesn't really have the, the, the technical skill base anywhere of Ryan Spann. And I, I think, you know, the, that just sort of leads you to where the, this fight is, is that it's, it's two people with sort of similar games, but Kutalaba genuinely knows what to do with his one. Yeah, he never stops uh, trying, you know, Kudalaba. You know, he's he's unbelievably determined even when he's far too tired to be working as well. Yeah. And he can never be accused of not trying to implement a game plan. Like uh, sometimes it's completely insane. <laughs> okay. But he's generally, you know, he will come out with ideas for what he needs to do against someone and he will execute it. Uh, sometimes it's like, I'm going to try and have a technical stand-up. Uh, I'm going to try and sort of trade. I'm going to have stand-up exchanges with Magomed and Kaliev. But other times it's been shockingly like smart in its own way. Yeah. Like when he was like, I'm going to just come out and absolutely run Khalil Roundtree over. Yeah. Which, as it turned out, worked perfectly. And honestly, if I think if he does that to Devin Clark, there is a small chance that Devin Clark will nuke him. But... It's not a big chance. No. And Kutalaba has a very good chin and has never been submitted. Yep. Yeah, you kind of have to pick Kutalaba. He's, he's just, again, this is like these two fights is like you have to pick who's the more consistent of a remarkably inconsistent fighter. Yep. Uh, and and uh, in, in both cases, it basically comes down to this guy is more inconsistent for one round. <laughs> yeah. I mean, once again, should this go deep? Oh yeah. I, I trust Ewan Kutalaba more than more than most of the other guys to to actually keep his pace going to some extent. Yeah. But if he comes out looking like that Jacobo, Jacoby fight and that doesn't work again, he's going to be knackered again. Well, I mean, we could you... be into two 
consecutive light heavyweight fights that just devolve into absolute trash. Yeah, yeah. But I don't know what Devin Clark does with Iwan Kudalaba type pressure if he's not physically mm-hmm. superior. And I don't think he is really going to be notably stronger than Kudalaba, especially not if Kudalaba can drain his gas tank trying to hit, you know, 19 takedowns over the course of the fight like he did against Jacoby. And, you know, you praise – this is this is the magic of Kudalaba. You praised his uh, approach to Khalil Roundtree. It's the same approach to, to Jacoby. Yeah. He just didn't finish him. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's the thing. He comes out very determined to, do th- to like, do stuff. Yeah. To do one thing. Uh, and it's either bombs or it's tons yeah. of clinch takedowns. Yep. And single legs. He's got a nice single, too. Uh, yeah, I think he'll out-wrestle Devin Clark, and uh, I think this is just the kind of fight where putting your um, best foot forward is very important. I don't see what kind of solutions Devin Clark comes up with down the stretch um, if he just has all of his energy drained by a man who, while definitely capable of gassing himself out, doesn't really care. Mm-hmm. So, yep. Kudalaba. Okay, let's talk about a better fight. Arman Sarukian... Christos Jagos, I say better fight, but the real point is, um, um, Arman Surkian is a much better fighter than almost anyone else on this card. Yeah. I mean, this is the thing. When, when, now that we've done all these in a row, and Christos Jagos really feels of a type. Yeah. With, uh, the people we've been looking at before, because he is tough. Uh huh. He is physically fairly imposing. Uh, he's quite durable, but not, you know, he has, physically, he's, he's sort of decent everywhere, but he's, he's fairly well rounded, but without any particular technical edge, uh, that, that stands out. He's really, I mean, he, he's, he's much better than, uh, Ryan Spann or, uh, Devin Clark, but that's because he has to be, because he's a lightweight. Right. He wouldn't be here if he was as bad as them. We would never have heard of him. But, uh, yeah, he's like, for his division, he is really much of a muchness with those guys. Yep. And I don't know whether it's just the fact that those guys are blinding me, but he's just, he's just a tough, a tough guy. Yeah. And that's sort of the type that, uh, Armin Surkin has been feasting on thus far through his UFC career. I mean, definitely different permutations of your classic MMA meathead. Mm-hmm. Um, wildly different in some ways. You know, Davi Hamosh, you would not say as much like, I don't know, Matt Frivola. Um, but, but they're all guys who rely heavily on intensity. You know, I'm going to throw really hard. I'm going to pressure really hard. It's like, I don't know. It's like a, a Snapple cap MMA, you know, like inspirational quotes MMA versus, um, like, Deep wells of technique, which is Armin Sarukian's thing. He's like a, he's like a wrestle boxer. In fact, Christos Jagos used to be kind of what a wrestle boxer looked like. Mm-hmm. Um, Armin Sarukian is like a new school of wrestle boxer in that he's extremely technical with both of those things and they connect really, really well. Um, yeah. He's a, I mean, I think the other thing that makes uh, Jagos of a type with, the, you know, not just the people we talked about so far, but uh, with the people that Sarukian has fought so far in his career, is that he is broadly a stocky grappler. Yeah. Uh, and, and that, I think, is it's slightly concerning to me from a matchup perspective, uh, because... I'm, uh, you know, spoiler warning, I'm expecting Tarukian to win. Yeah. And I'm not really expecting to learn very much. I don't know what I can learn from this f- fight. Right. I'm thinking at, at, a po- at this point, I'm now thinking like Tarukian was good enough to hang with, uh, Islam Makachev and he was very nascent in the UFC on the ground. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have no real worries about him against almost any caliber of grappler. I would le- like to see him fight aggressive strikers and more than that aggressive strikers who can match his reach mm-hmm. um because yeah with, with this fight jagos has been uh this fight feels like uh the olivera fight for for jagos is that he's 
he's just outgunned everywhere. Yeah. Uh, Tsurukian is a taller guy. He's a rangy striker who can kick and jab from a distance, and he can probably hit takedowns when he wants to as well. The main thing is just, like, uh, it's a physical test, which I I don't need to see Tsurukian pass at this point. I've yeah. seen him, as I said, do so against Hamosh and against uh, and against uh, Makhachev. Yep. Yeah, career-wise. And against, it's, it's frankly, nothing. Olivier Oban Mercier, mm-hmm. who I think is a in many ways, a significant step up from Christos Chiagos and someone that I would expect to pro- possibly finish Yeah, Chiagos. Yeah, that's the thing. I mean, this is really just an opportunity to talk about Sarukian. <laughs> it's, mm-hmm. it's, a, it's a learn nothing, stay busy kind of matchup. Um, where, you know, again, Chiagos is, is very intense. I mean, I, say what you will uh, about him getting absolutely tuned up for the bulk of his last fight against uh, the returning Jean Soriano. He, he gutted out a win, uh, uh-huh. after getting just completely torn to pieces on the feet. But Sarukian's not Sean Soriano. He doesn't have like a big gap in his technical game. Um, you said he can jab from long distance. He can jab from any distance. It's one of the things I really like about him. And, and, and at any point in a sequence, uh, that Sarukian is, is really, really good at finding that jab as a lead. Um, you know, and as a pot shot. But also as a, as a, like a link in a different sequence of moves, coming between two different moves or covering a retreat when his feet get a little out of position, he will poke you with the jab so that you can't take advantage of him. Um, and then he's just going to out wrestle Jagos as well, which is again, like the only way Jagos got back into the fight with Soriano was that he was able to out grapple him. Um, and Sorkin is just, a, f- a really phenomenally good wrestler. He, you know what he does so well is, um, you know how like on commentary, Daniel Cormante, uh, Daniel Cormante, <laughs> Daniel, wow. Cor- Daniel Cormentator is always saying, <laughs> <laughs> is always saying, um, you know, people get into clinch wrestling positions up against the fence and somebody will get like halfway to an angle and, and Daniel Cormier would always be shouting at them like, okay, now you just have to do one more move. And you've got the takedown. You got around to his side. Now just, you know, step back and get the lift. You know, get your hips under him, whatever. There's always like another step in MMA wrestling that a lot of fighters just aren't quick enough to take. And that Sarukian, watch his fight with Matt Frivola. He is like all over him and progressively building every single takedown attempt as the fight goes on. Um, I often say that the difference between grappling and striking is that um, position comes before attack in both. But in grappling, you can hold on to a position. You can make it stick and then think about your attack. Mm-hmm. And in striking, the position is being taken away from you immediately because no fighter is going to just let you stand behind them or or, or not be facing you. They're going to adjust the moment you take an angle. And so you have to hit them while they're adjusting. And I feel like wrestling is sort of halfway between, uh, where, especially wrestling, you know, on the feet, where you, you might get to an angle on somebody in a clinch. Um, you've got a body lock, say, and you can hold on to it to a degree, but it is often best to treat it like a striking angle because the person's on their feet and they're going to quickly try to make an adjustment and turn into you. And this is where we see so many, uh, would be MMA wrestlers fail, I think, is that they will get to a strong angle, uh, on their opponent and then just not immediately take advantage of the position. And they let their opponent work back in. And so we get an endless amount of just 50 50. One guy takes the underhook and puts the opponent against the fence. They reverse. They reverse again. We get so many of those exchanges, uh, those wrestling exchanges in MMA. And I just don't think Sarukian allows those exchanges. You know, when he gets in on a body lock and then gets to an angle, he is ripping you across his knee or he is throwing you one way and then switching to the double and taking you down. Um, he's immediately attacking your balance once he senses that he has it compromised, which makes the fact that he can flow into those wrestling positions off of his pretty technically sound boxing 
um, all the more difficult to deal with. Yeah, absolutely. Like he is a he's a, he's a remarkable talent in the division. As I said, I think there's still there's still some things to be uh, to be concerned about. I think he's yeah. he's definitely like. He's. I think he's very aggressive with his jab and his counter punching, in part because he kind of has to be. Yeah. Uh, once people can get past the jab, uh, you know, sort of slightly similar to Anthony Smith, they're often just. He's often just like either stuck brawling with them or just retreating out of range. Mm-hmm. There's a solid chance he's going to get you know badly clocked one of these days. Oh yeah. But for someone, I mean, he's still insanely young. How old is he? Twenty four. I think so. Yeah, 24. Fantastic. It's coming up um, on 25 in October. But yeah, I mean, he's got, he's got aggression. He's got confidence. He's fairly, uh, he's got a lot of skill in both of the basic areas of the game. He's, I think that confidence is very important as well, as we've seen, like, he's, even when he, he's very happy even when he's got a clear skill edge in the other part of the fight, he's very he's very happy in that kind of GSPS way to yeah. force his other advantages as well. He's yeah. still pretty happy to grapple with W. Hamosh because he was just like, oh, I I think I've got this, you know. Um, but yeah, so he's he's a uh, still a pretty fantastic prospect. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing more from him. I think he probably should win this one pretty handily. I think he should try and not finish it though, because I don't think he actually wants to get pushed up the um, the division as fast as like finish would. Yeah, I mean, I don't know that he's um, much of a consistent finisher to begin with. I think at a certain point he's going to like chase submissions, but people will spin out of them, and he doesn't necessarily have a uh, you know he's he's not going to like he he notably does not commit to submission attacks in any way that would ever cost him position which mm-hmm. uh which you know can compromise your ability to actually secure those finishes they make he makes excellent use of them as threats to direct his opponent um and to to just stay a couple steps ahead in scrambles but they do cause scrambles that he then adjusts to to keep position not to continue attacking um, mm-hmm. And I don't think he's a super powerful puncher, so nope. um, yeah, it's not it's not hugely likely. Um, yeah, he's he's uh, he's great fun to watch, and as you said, like easily the best sort of athlete, and uh, I think just in in general, he is the fighter to watch of this card. He's the only guy on the card who feels like a student of the game, if you know what I mean. He thinks like he seems like he sort of thinks about what he's gonna do. <laughs> <laughs> between fights, <laughs> unlike the likes of Iwan Kudalab and Devin Clark, um, who were like, yeah. "When's when is next strength and conditioning?" Um, I'm a. This is a fat guy sitting in a computer chair making fun of pro, pro athletes <laughs> for being blockheads. Just keep that in mind. Anyway, let's take another break. When we come back, um, UFC 266 looms. I think I would also like to talk. Just just mention. Um, another wonderful thing that happened over the weekend. We'll get to that after this. Financial support is fantastic, but there are other, even easier ways to support Heavy Hands. Perhaps the best is by spreading the word. We know our fan base. You're all cool, popular people with serious social media presences. You're tastemakers and trendsetters. Okay, there are one or two of you that don't fit that description. You know who you are, but no matter what, you can always help us out by telling folks about the show. You can also give us a positive rating and review on iTunes and Stitcher, things like that. We rely on word of mouth and positive feedback to grow and improve, so thank you very much for your time and your help. Now, back to the show. Where are these guys at kind of fight? Yeah. Well, I'll let you kick it off. Welcome back to Heavy Hands. Um, I want to talk uh, later, by the way, about... um, I just want to laugh about Anderson Silva knocking out Tito Ortiz. Uh, but and also, presumably, uh, Vito defending MMA's honor. Yeah, 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 yeah. Finally, finally, we have an MMA fighter beating a credible boxer in his prime. Um, yeah, a world, a world champion. One of the five time champion. Yeah, one of the top 10 heavyweights of all time, no doubt. Are we talking about that now? Cause I do have. <laughs> 
Yeah, why not? Okay, fine. We're going to talk about um, Dan Hooker, Nasrat Hawkbrust, a very good fight uh, after this. Um, okay, so Vitor versus Holyfield was one of the saddest things I've ever seen. Um, it was really depressing to watch the moment the fight be- – even Holyfield didn't look like he wanted to be there from the very beginning. I think they must have thrown a shitload of money at him. I hope so because I don't know why else he did it. And uh, the referee was fortunately very merciful. You know, like Holyfield got uh, knocked down, and, and it was really as much a trip as anything else. Like he just sort of fell over Belfort's leg uh, in the open stance. But, you know, that just sort of demonstrated how clumsy and slow his feet were. And uh, then he got hit with a big punch, and the ref called it off. And that was good. You know what I thought was interesting? Holyfield sounded – did you see that video like th- four or five days ago of Holyfield doing an interview and he sounded like unbelievably punch drunk? Oh? No. Well, it was really depressing. He sounded really punch drunk. I thought it was interesting that after getting rocked by Vitor Belfort, he went and was talking to 50 Cent, who didn't say like one word the entire broadcast except when he got to talk to Evander Holyfield. <laughs> He's talking to 50 hey, Cent. Guys, you- He's got his priorities in order. Yeah, 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 yeah. He's talking to 50 Cent and uh, Sean Porter and whoever the announcer guy was, the guy whose voice I kind of, I find kind of annoying. And um, he sounded like super lively and, and clear spoken in comparison. It was almost like when you play like an Alzheimer's patient, like their favorite music, and they come back to life. You know what I mean? Yeah, so what you're suggesting is that we should punch Alzheimer's patients in the head. <laughs> it was just weird that, like, even though I, it was a horrible use experience. The, <laughs> use the Saturday morning cartoon th- theorem of fixing brain damage. <laughs> yeah, you just have to press that lump on Holyfield's head down, causing briefly another lump. But then if you knock them all down quickly enough, <laughs> they'll all stay in. No, he... um. Yeah, it was just kind of weird that he, it was like he, being in a familiar environment and everything. And, uh, he was, uh, he was enlivened by that. Uh, I will that, say there's two things. Uh, yeah, no, that, that does actually genuinely make sense to me. And, but it's also a terrible thought. Oh, yeah. Um, the thing that made two his, things. The I'm thing that made very his disappointed. Brain, and yeah, go on. Exceptionally disappointed that Vitor didn't run around the ring screaming jujitsu after knocking. Yeah. What do you feel that? Because if there was ever a time, that is 100% it. <laughs> um, and secondly, that I think the sort of comedy of the, and the sort of, and the comeuppance of Anderson and Tito and, and all that, really the absolute vileness of the Hollyfield, uh, Belfort booking. Yeah. Did, Get to a clue how disgusting it was to book Vitor against Anderson as well. Wait, like, because people just got to enjoy that one guilt free. T- Tito Anderson. Tito oh, against yeah, Anderson. Yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I wouldn't have. All, felt... all, all the bad feelings got to go into that one, and this one was yeah. just like, well, Tito's Tito is also insanely shot and was always terrible at, at striking, but at least this is funny. And and it kind of was. It was very funny. I mean, Tito is like there are there are certain people where you just like um completely dehumanize them. <laughs> You're like this person's a caricature. They're a character here for my entertainment. That's Tito Ortiz. I'm sorry to say. I know it's awful and cruel and heartless, but I feel like no matter what happens to Tito Ortiz, I will be enjoying it. I'm saying that knowing that now something horrible is going to happen. But like for example. After this loss, Phil, he was just on Twitter saying that people don't know the sacrifices he had to make. And then it listed among his sacrifices were drinking water every day, only having steak three times in the last month, and <laughs> salads. <laughs> salads? <laughs> it was all food related. And he just sort of that said... Is. <laughs> he, he said... He said salads and then he sort of just stared into the middle distance for a good five seconds like he was really haunted by the salads <laughs> just got these visions of <laughs> just 
cucumber and lettuce just floating disembodied <laughs> past his eyes. I had to eat a radish. Um, yeah, he is a hundred percent. He, I mean, I don't know. I must have said this before. He's remarkably similar to an actual real life version of like one of those characters that Ben Stiller would play. Yeah. Like specifically the guy from Dodgeball. He, I mean, he's really that guy. All the yeah. malapropisms, the insane stuff he says. He's exactly like that. We've been trained to see someone like that as not real because it's impossible to see him as real. He's like a Coen brothers, like one scene minor character. Where like they have, they uh-huh. only have two minutes on screen, so you make them as broad and ridiculous as possible. But Tito Ortiz is like that all the time. All the time. Anyway, I have very little to say about his actual fight with Anderson, uh, other than that the ultimate, the ultimate <laughs> salt in the wound is the sheer number of people who are convinced that the fight was fixed simply because they cannot imagine that Tito could actually be that bad at boxing. Yeah, because now, uh, yeah, now the honor of MMA has been regained in that you know uh, an MMA champion defeated a boxing champion. Yeah. But now we have to defend the MMA, the honor of MMA, by pointing out that actually MMA fighters are really bad at striking. People were like, he threw the same super slow hook three times in a row. And he looked like he was about to throw it a fourth time. Why would you do that if you weren't throwing the fight? And I say, listen, my child. <laughs> Sit down on my knee and I'll tell you. Actually, the best example, I already tweeted this as well, but uh, I have to share it here. On the broadcast during the fight, um, the commentators were, were recalling, you know, their pre-fight interviews with Tito Ortiz. And this is as close to a direct quote as I can, as I can make it on memory. Tito said the hardest thing to learn when making the switch from MMA was the head movement. He says in MMA, you don't move your head. So if that doesn't tell you why his striking looked so bad, folks, um, it wasn't fixed. I'm sorry. Tito Ortiz would not sign up to be knocked stiff in front of Donald Trump. That wouldn't happen. No, He would not do that. Okay, um, let's talk about a real fight. Nasrud Hakpras, Dan Hooker. Um, genuinely a very interesting fight. Uh, I, I can see a couple of like obvious paths where this might go, but I think the first question to ask is the one that you raised before, Phil. It's kind of a, um, it, in, in different ways for each man, a sort of status check matchup. Mm hmm. Because for Hawk Perust, it's, you know, Dan Hooker at range. The number of times Hawk Perust has almost gotten boxed up by an opponent and then gutted it out by, like, athletically much inferior opponents. Alexander Munoz had plenty of moments in a fight he otherwise lost clearly. Hafa Garcia had tons of moments in a fight he otherwise lost clearly. Likewise, for Thibaut Guti, had tons of success against Nasrat Hakparas while likewise having no real case for having won the necessary rounds. Um, but all of these guys were able to land lots of jabs. Body shots are just eternally open on Nasrat Hakparas, Um and sort of just outmaneuver him and have, like, better ideas. At a certain point in a lot of fights, Hakparas seems to sort of devolve into his base elements of just being mm-hmm. a lightning-fast southball who loves knocking people out. Um, and Dan Hooker could do that. Possibly enough to actually win with it this time. But, uh, then you have to question where Dan Hooker's at right now. So what do you think? Yeah, because I mean, essentially, you would be like, uh, Dan Hooker is the, cl- one of the classical, he's a big guy who's built to, to beat up on level changes. You know, we mentioned that many times. Um, and, you know, as such, you'd be, you'd be, we thought that he would be a good matchup against Michael Chandler. Yeah. I mean, uh, also, you know, as someone who was historically insanely durable. Mm-hmm. But, but the thing is, the problem with, with being a kind of defensive, not necessarily a defensive specialist, but a specialist at, at fighting something like that is that it can still go wrong. 
And when it did against Chandler, he just, I mean, well, he, he got instantly knocked out. So, I mean, Hack Brass might be one note, but it's the one note which just knocked, which knocked, uh, Hooker out in his last fight. It was getting chased down by an aggressive person and then got getting knocked out by basically leaping into a, I believe it was a left hand, right? It was a left hook, yeah. An orthodox left hook. It was a shifting, yeah, it was a shifting left hook, Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So in, in some ways it may have well as been a surprise South Pole left hand. Um, now we posited at the time that a big part of that, um, of Dan Hooker's series of bad reactions and bad choices in, in the short, like two minutes or, or whatever that that fight was allowed to elapse almost certainly had to do with his concern of Chandler's takedown game. And that almost certainly put him in the position where that left hook knocked him out the way it did. Um, granted, it was also set up by just classic boxing shit. It was a right hand to the body. Um, and he was not in position to do anything defensively and was just running away Edson Barboza style. Um, but Hawk Press at least doesn't really have that one threat. It's not like he can't wrestle. But I would actually be surprised to see him out-wrestle Dan Hooker. I'll put it that way. Yep. So, here's the other thing. Nasra Hockprest has been periodically outboxed by a series of mostly little dudes. And Dan Hooker's not a little dude. Uh, um, this is essentially the first, I mean, I, I wish I had the, uh, had pulled the numbers up ahead of time. Dan Hooker's gotta be. Oh, by a long stretch, the biggest man that Hawk Bros has fought, possibly since, I don't know, Marching Held's pretty lanky. Five, nine, 71 inches for Marching Held. What's Dan Hooker at? Six foot, 75 inch reach. Um, Dan Hooker has a jab. He has a kicking game. His footwork is not excellent, but neither is Nasrat Hawk Bros for consistently cutting off the cage. Um, so does that, is that enough, assuming he doesn't get knocked out, isn't that enough to probably turn those limited successes previous boxers have had against Hawk Frost into like round winning successes? Uh, yes, probably with the one exception that maybe just, uh, maybe Dan Hooker just doesn't like completely consistent aggression. Maybe he, he just really doesn't like people being on top of him the whole time, as in not not in a, like necessarily a wrestling sense, but he doesn't like being on the back foot. Like, do you think Hawk consistently Rust will be on top of him the whole time? Pretty much. He isn't always. I think that's, what's that? He isn't always. Yeah. He he's had he's, uh, lots and lots of periods of of trying to do the like. Uh, the straightforward, like, uh, back up to the right or back up to the left so you can cut across with the left hand kind of thing. Um, yeah. He does try to walk people onto shots. I think it, I think it, it just really, really depends. And this is always the case with Hawk Brust. It really, really depends on how Hooker approaches the fight. But that was the case with the Chandler fight too. Like, if Hooker had stood his ground, something else bad might have happened, but that, what did happen would not have happened. It was specifically a result of him constantly scurrying away from Michael Chandler's aggression. Um, but he doesn't always do that. So what, what makes the decision <laughs> is my question. Yeah, I think it's a, it's a tough one. Um, but I think I'm in general picking up what you're putting down here. I mean, I don't think that. I mean, I can't, I can't trust Hack Brast at this point because he's been given moderate, not light touches, but sort of the same fight over and over again. And he hasn't really gotten that much better at winning it. And this is not the same fight over and over again. Yeah. This is a long, tall, this is a person, it's a much dangerous, more dangerous punch than anyone he's fought, bar Drew Dober, who knocked him out. Yep. Um, it's, uh, someone who's, you know, so much of Hack Brust's approach is sort of stepping in behind that big left hand. I would be 
utterly unsurprised to see um, Hooker be able to either step knee or uppercut him on the way in. Mm -hmm. Uh, Yeah, I mean, I've I've got to pick Hooker as long as he's in some kind of... As long as he's in some kind of uh, physical and mental state approximating his prime. Right. And that he makes the right decisions. I mean, again, I do think yeah. you you can definitely persuade Hawk Bros to fight off the back foot where he, he's, he's just not typically as effective. I will say to your point about him not, um, showing much improvement. I, I mean, I agree. Um, but, uh, he did finally show some like good decision making in that most recent fight. Again, an opponent that was like short armed. And not as good an athlete, um, though a pretty solid, capable boxer, Rafa Garcia. Uh, actually, it might be Rafa. And, um, and, and it did still, once again, sort of take, like, actually, I guess it was kind of the opposite. Like, Hawk Prost sort of did his, like, simple dumb guy, um, moves. And then as Garcia started to pressure him, he started to make good decisions. It was actually the inverse of what typically happens, where he might start with some good ideas and then sort of devolve. Uh, he worked the body pretty well. He worked off his jab much more consistently, just as a weapon in and of itself, um, and started to put together a lot of nice combinations. He also like found an opening. I think it was a front kick to the body. He found yeah. an opening with an atypical technique and realized it was working and stuck to it. Um, which is a good sign. I just think as long as Hooker doesn't just run away from him the whole time though, Hawk Prost is going to be in a fight where he just has to eat tons and tons of jabs. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that's just not a good, that's just not a good matchup for him. He's eaten tons and tons of jabs from little dudes with short arms already. So yeah, I, I gotta go with, uh, I gotta go with Hooker as well. With the caveat that, like, it's not at all unlikely that Hawk Press just leaps in after a retreating Hooker and hits him with a huge overhand left. He does do that. Yep. But, you know, he also doesn't knock people out in round one. That's true. He really doesn't. Never mm-hmm. done it in the UFC, hasn't done it since he was on the regional scene in Germany. And it's not as if Hooker habitually gets knocked out in any round anyway. He's typically yep. an insanely durable fighter. And Michael Chandler is a notable first-round knockout artist. Yep. All right. Dan Hooker is the pick. Um, I would love for this to be the fight where Nasrat Hakprost, um I don't know. I just want to see. Maybe he's just been stagnating because he's just been fighting a bunch of similar-ish guys. Um, I don't think that's the case, though. I, I don't know. No, I think it's one of those ones where, like, you would get comfortable enough to show the th- things that you'd been working on kind mm-hmm. of thing if you were fighting the same people the whole time. I think it is genuine stagnation. But, yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm hoping to see more. I'm hoping to see, you know, hook a, hook a look... More like himself. Yeah, that too. Either of those would satisfy me. All right. Well, um, that's it for this week's episode of Heavy Hands. Very much looking forward to next week's show. Um, I think I've teased this once already, but uh, assuming uh, nothing happens in the interim, we are going to have the Fight Sites' Ryan Wagner on the show. He asked long ago when we had him on to discuss, I don't know, probably some other terrible light heavyweight fight for us to uh, have him back when Volkanovski versus Ortega finally rolled around and uh, it's ahead of us. And assuming again that nothing happens in the interim, we've got that. We've got a boy, a, a long awaited Valentina Shevchenko title fight against Lauren. Murphy. Oh, I, I think, I think uh, Ryan is enough of a vile hipster that he's actually sort of decided to take the, con- the, um, contrary approach that he rather likes Valentina Shevchenko, so that should be fun. Oh, that'll be great. That'll be great. That'll be great. Um, that'll be great. That'll be great. Uh, <laughs> and then Nick Diaz versus Robbie Lawler, which is not really a meaningful fight by any stretch of the imagination, but there's a lot of history to it, and it's interesting and sort of depressing to think about. We're going to talk about all of that and as much uh, as we can uh, from the rest of USC 266. And um, 
Then after that, it's another light heavyweight main event. God damn it, Phil. <laughs> Why do they do this? There's so that's many light and, heavyweights. That's so big and powerful. I thought there were only like 30 light heavyweights on the roster. Where do they find them all? Anyway, that's it. Um, Phil, you don't have anything coming out this week, do you? Uh, all I really have to say is, I guess, enjoy the visit section. Great. Wonderful. Um, find me on social media at Boxing Bush, B U S C H. Phil does not deserve your follows, so I will not share his Twitter handle. Um, check out our Patreon, and I guess check out the MMA visit section with me and Zane Simon. We talk about the whole, <laughs> the whole card. All of it. Until then, and until next week's good episode and good card. If you came here today for the finer points of Facebook, and you came to the right place. This has been Heavy Hands. At Evil Greg Jackson on Twitter. <laughs>